Good morning to our family of faith. <laughs> Jesus is the Prince of Peace, and at Advent we light candles to remind ourselves of the light of hope and the promise of peace that he brought to a world ravaged by sin. But what is peace? Peace is the end, peace is the end of hostility and fighting. Peace is as it should be. It's harmony, it's rightness, it's goodness. And as an example of what it's not, if you look at what's going on in Paris, France, the unrest and the fighting, you can see what it is not. Isaiah gives us the prophecy of the Messiah's coming. And uh, it's in Isaiah 9, 6, and 7. For, for a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us, and the government will rest on his shoulders. And his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. There will be no end to the increase of his government of peace on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it, to uphold it, and, and justice and righteousness from then on and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will accomplish this. We find the fulfillment of this prophecy recorded by Luke. Now in those days, and this, this is Luke 2, 1 through 7. Now in those days a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that a census be taken of all the inhabited earth. This was the first census taken while Quirinius was governor of Syria. And everyone was on his way to register for the census, each to his own city. Joseph also went up to Galilee, from the city of Nazareth to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house of the family of David in order to register along with Mary, who, who was engaged to him and was with child. While they were there, the days were completed for her to give birth. And she gave birth to the firstborn son, and she wrapped him, uh, wrapped him in cloths and laid him in a manger because there was no room for him in the inn. In the New Testament, Paul explains more to us about the peace that's brought to us through Jesus. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were formerly far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ, for he himself is our peace. He abolished in his flesh the enmity, thus establishing peace. Ephesians 2, 13 through 15. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Romans 5, 1. Join me now as we go to God in prayer. Lord, Lord our God, we thank you for sending Jesus to make everything right between us. We're grateful for the peace that comes through knowing him. Help us to be champions of your peace. May we be peacemakers in a world torn by sin and strife. Help us be yours as we wait for you to come again. We love you, Lord, and we pray these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. book of Colossians, Colossians 3.15, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. Would you stand and join me as we sing, O come all ye faithful. Please worship with us this morning.
read from Philippians chapter 2, beginning in verse 5. Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. Join me in prayer. Lord, we're thankful for the opportunity again during this Advent season to think about you, your plan of salvation, your son who came to fulfill that plan finalized before the foundation of the world, that plan which is the reason that we have life. Jesus solved the universal problem, our sin. And he who knew no sin became sin on our behalf. He drew us to you. He loved us while we were yet sinners. He died for us. All of that is wrapped up into this, this amazing story that we acknowledge that is what we celebrate, the birth of Jesus. We pray once again as we have gathered in this special place that you would speak to us. May none of us here come to the conclusion that we've heard it all, we know it all, there's nothing new that can be discerned from this amazing truth that you love us and that you sent your son. Please bless the rest of our service. Thank you for speaking to us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. As you're seated, if you'll join me as we sing, it came upon a, the midnight clear. And then when we get to verse two, I invite the children to come down for our time of children's worship. place looking pretty, don't they? Yeah, getting ready to celebrate a birthday, right? Jesus' birthday, that's right. How's school going? Good. Y'all about to get out, right? So it's getting even better. A couple more weeks, two weeks. Two weeks and two days. <laughs> Got it down to a, a specific time. I was thinking about when um, Liam was a little bit younger in school. Um, my kids go to Lamar, and Lamar, especially in the elementary, the kindergarten, the first, the second, um, hang on just a sec, they have something called Me Week. Do, do y'all's schools do Me Week? You go to Lamar, don't you? So, yeah, you know Me Week. Yeah. 
So Me Week, if, if you don't have a Me Week, um, Me Week is a week where you go to class and everything's about you. You make this poster with all of your pictures on it, and they hang it in the room where people can see it. You're the line leader for the whole week. Anywhere you go, you're first in line, which means you're first to get anywhere, right? First in line at the cafeteria and that sort of thing. They throw a party for you at the end of the week. And at some point during the week, your mom and dad can come up and eat lunch with you, have a special lunch with you. Parents get involved too. We, we get to buy all that stuff. It's a lot of fun. <laughs> but the point of what I was, I was making, Me Week is, is an awesome week and it's all about you. You, you feel kind of like a little king or a queen of the classroom. You're king of the classroom for a week, right? Your Me Week was last week, so all that's familiar, right? Cool. What would you guys think if, if you had a Me Week and you got there and the teacher said, I'm going to need you to give up your Me Week? Shake your head. There, you don't want to give up your Me Week? It'd be kind of hard to do, right? Kind of hard to give up your Me Week? Kind of hard to be give up your king for the week, your queen for the week. Jesus was a king, is a king, right? King in heaven. The scripture that Dr. Park just read talks about what Jesus did when he came to earth, what we're about to celebrate, Christmas. Except nobody told Jesus, you're going to have to give up your crown. You're going to have to give up your me time. In fact, the scripture tells us that Jesus didn't think that being the king in heaven was more important than what he had to do. He didn't get mad at all. More than that, nobody had to tell him to do what he did. Jesus took his crown off on purpose. And he put it down and he came to earth as a servant. You know, you have kings and then you have servants. They're on opposite ends of the pole. He chose to go from king to servant. And when he got here, he healed the sick, he fed people. He was the friend to people who didn't have any friends. He went from as high as you can get down to as low as you can get. And he chose to. Do you guys want to be like Jesus? If I asked that a different way, would you rather be a king or a servant? I hope you'd pick servant because that's the same question. If you want to be like Jesus, we have to do what Jesus did. We have to take the focus off ourselves and put it on other people. And that's our choice. We have to choose to do it. Okay, I'm going to pray for us. We'll go back to our seats. And I hope during the next week you guys take that opportunity to choose to be like Jesus. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for, for all of these opportunities in front of me, Father. Lord, shine your light on them. Remind them of who you are and what you came to do. And Lord, I, I would ask that you give them opportunities, opportunity upon opportunity to show this world your light, to be like you in every instance they can be. God, thank you so much for the promise that you give them that, that if they live as servants for your people today, then one day they are kings in heaven with you. Father God, lead us, guide us, and direct us, and forgive us where we fail you. In the Father's name I ask these things. Amen. Thanks, God. As we continue with worship, would you stand as we sing Angels from the Realms of Glory and Worthy You Are Worthy.
Shall we pray? <clears throat> Father God, we know you are worthy, worthy to be praised and adored. And we know that you are the King of kings and Lord of lords. And we'll take this time to say that and worship you now. Lord, uh, at this Advent season, when they reminded of the saving grace of your son, Jesus Christ, who delivered us from sin. And if there's anybody here today who doesn't know Jesus Christ as their Savior, may the message that Dr. Park delivers bring them to you. Now bless us in tithes and offerings and forgive us where we fail thee in so many ways. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you so much for leading us and we're looking forward to next Sunday night you will be here right yes and you will invite others as well I had the privilege of going to the Morrison Heights presentation yesterday and and just once again the Lord 
moved in a mighty way. And, and it reminded me of how powerful such opportunities can be. Music, God's gift to us, does well to communicate the gospel. And because you'll be inviting folks, folks that don't come, don't want to hear a preacher, are more likely to listen to great music and what they don't realize, they get bombarded with the gospel. So, not only come and do your part and, and reach out to a family member or a friend and pray for everybody involved. There's, there's a lot of moving parts to make possible what happens next Sunday night. So pray for the, the voices, pray for the, the, the instrumentalists, pray for health, such that nobody loses a voice. Pray for Abby as, as she's, of course, providing great leadership. And then pray for, for to, uh, next, next Sunday night. Uh, even pray for, for things that we don't typically think of. Sound system, technology, all of that. There's so much that, that is involved to, to do what they will do next Sunday night through hard work effortlessly and we're thankful to have them. In 1954, psychotherapist C.H. Thigpen and H. Cleckley published a bizarre case study titled The Three Faces of Eve. Their client, Eve White, also known as Chris Sizemore, had experienced severe headaches and blackouts during counseling her personality fragmented. They wrote, I quote, as if seized by a sudden pain, she put both hands to her head. After a moment of Tense silence, both hands dropped. There was a quick, reckless smile, and in a bright voice that sparkled, she said, Hi there, Doc. The demure and constrained posture of Eve White had melted away into buoyant repose. This new and apparently carefree girl spoke casually of Eve White and her problems, always using she and her in every reference, always respecting the strict bounds of a separate identity. When asked her name, she immediately replied, oh, I'm Eve Black. Therapy continued for 14 months. Evelyn and Jane joined Eve Black. After therapy, Eve White discovered 18 additional persons inhabiting her mind. Schizophrenia, no. Multiple personality disorder, or at least what used to be called multiple personality disorder. What used to be called multiple personality disorder, unlike schizophrenia, is quite rare. Cases of multiple personality are frequently mislabeled in the popular press as schizophrenic reactions. Believe it or not, the Bible mentions dysfunctional personalities. Listen, just listen to three scriptures. First, listen to James chapter 1, verse 8. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. 
Listen to Proverbs chapter 18 and verse 14. The spirit of a man can endure his sickness, but a broken spirit, who can bear? And then listen to Proverbs chapter 19 and verse 19. A man of great anger shall bear the penalty. For if you rescue him, you will only have to do it again. Y'all, believe it or not, the Bible also prescribes mental fitness. Listen to Proverbs, excuse me, Philippians. Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 through 8. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, shall guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good repute, if there is any excellence and if anything worthy of praise, let your mind dwell on these things. Listen to Romans chapter 12 and verse 2. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. Finally, our text. Philippians chapter 2, beginning in verse 5, the King James Version reads, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Verse 6, who also, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. As we consider this text from Philippians, a hymn, some New Testament scholars believe a hymn of the early church that Paul quotes. Consider the following truth, that the life of Christ Jesus previews the lives of his followers. That would be us. Jesus. He hung on a cross. His followers take up their cross daily. Jesus died for sinners. His followers die to sin. Jesus rose again. His followers are more than conquerors, new creatures, old things having passed away. He became fully human. And so the Apostle Paul exhorted not only the Christians at Philippi, but as well the Christians in Meridian with this passage from Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 8. In his book, Knowing God, J.I. Packer wrote, how are we to think of the incarnation? Now, I interject. The incarnation is that theological term that refers to the Christmas event. It's a Latin word that we now have as an English noun. Literally means the in flesh experience of the second person of the Trinity. You know, when the eternal Son of God became the Son of Mary and Joseph, the incarnation. J.I. Packer, that great theologian and author, wrote How are we to think of the incarnation? 
He continues, the New Testament does not encourage us to puzzle our minds over the physical and psychological problems that it raises, but to worship God for the love that was shown in it. If you could summarize the Christmas story in a word other than Jesus, would it not be love? The very reason that he came? He loved us so much. He demonstrated his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So from this text, consider three ways that the Lord Jesus loved us. This great love story, which is the Christmas story based upon Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 8. First evidence that the Lord Jesus loved us, first point, Jesus surrendered his prominent position. What was that prominent position? Of course, we heard it well during the children's message. Thank you, Jason. He's king of kings, right? He's Lord of Lords. Jesus surrendered his prominent position as God. It's God. Look at Philippians chapter 2, verse 6 and 7. Who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant, and being made in the likeness of men. The Greek verb translated to empty denotes to give up or to lay aside what one possesses. To give up or to lay aside what one possesses. In 1889, Englishman Bishop Gore addressed the following question. To what does emptying refer? He reasoned that Jesus relinquished his omnipotence, his omniscience, and his omnipresence. However, Jesus retained holiness, love, and truth. Whatever you think, however you contemplate what happened, when Jesus conceived in Mary's womb, then birthed in a stable, whatever you believe cannot contradict a fundamental fact. And that <laughs> fundamental fact is that Jesus was fully man and at the same time still fully God. Oh yeah. We could start having a, a brain throb as we think about the complexities of a very simple story that any child could appreciate. What happened? Y'all, Christ did not empty himself of Godhood. He did not cease to be what he essentially and eternally had been. Question, to what does emptying refer? The answer is a Greek noun that is translated form, which appears in both verse 6 and verse 7. Who, although he existed in the form of God, never ceased to be. He did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself and taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men. He'd always been in the form of God, but he took upon himself the form of a bondservant. So what we have here, even though the verb is emptying, we don't have subtraction 
Instead, we have addition. He'd always been God. He never was less than God. But he added to his form of God the form of a bond servant. For Jesus, form followed function. On earth, think about it. The Son of God was not enjoying the ultimate Halloween experience. He was not wearing a costume of flesh. Jesus of Nazareth was no disguise. His ministry does not compare to a politician who for the sake of a photo op will spend 30 minutes at a homeless shelter. No, the Son of God traded his glory for humility. He willingly limited himself, willingly subjected himself to the authority of the Father. Therefore, what he did, recorded in the Scripture, was not equal to what he could have done. But he willingly limited himself. He willingly submitted himself to the Father. In his exhaustive systematic theology, Millard Erickson explained. Picture the following analogy. The world's fastest sprinter is entered in a three-legged race where one of his legs is tied to the leg of a partner. Some of you can remember, I'm asking, for you to, to recall, some of you can remember participating in the joy of the three-legged race. I don't think we're doing that tonight, although I saw in the evangel that there'll be games tonight. I don't, I don't think there'll be any three-legged races. Hope not. Not based on how much I'm eating tonight. I'm not, I'm not doing it. Erickson then follows up with that regarding that world's fastest sprinter. Could it be that fella from the Caribbean, Usain Bolt? Yeah, let's think about him. In such a situation, Millard Erickson explains, although his ability is not diminished, the conditions under which he exercises it are severely restricting. Millard Erickson continues in his explanation. Or think of the world's greatest boxer fighting with one hand tied behind his back. Or a softball game in which parents competing against their kids will reverse their usual batting stance. Right-handed batters batting left-handed or left-handed batters batting right-handed. In each of these cases, Physical capacity, in essence, is not diminished. But the conditions imposed upon that physical ability mean that actual performance will be limited. The second evidence that the Lord Jesus loved us demonstrated through the Christmas story is that Jesus left his peaceful home. And that peaceful home, of course, heaven. Look at verse 7 and the first part of verse 8. But emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men and being found in appearance as a man. We, we cannot appreciate what he gave up when he left heaven. Y'all, we have no idea how wonderful heaven is. Can't wait. I think the best book on heaven is by Randy Alcorn. I don't know if, if any of you have ever seen that book. It, it is an amazing book. I get no money for this commercial. It, it's this thick and it's organized as question and answer and then, of course, substantiated by Scripture. If you wanted a, an excellent book on heaven, 
Randy Alcorn is a great resource. But even Randy doesn't know as much as my mom does. <laughs> my mom's got a head start. My mom's cheating because since October of 2010, my mom's been there. She knows exactly what it's like. I think, as I think about my mom, I, I just think it's, it's um, I, I, don't, I don't know the word. It's kind of amusing to me, but that's just not a, a good enough word. My mom barely graduated from high school, barely. Didn't mean that, that she wasn't unintelligent, but that school was really not her area of expertise. But she did graduate from high school. My dad, on the other hand, medically trained. He's, he's a doctor. My mom's son, she only has one son. I have a PhD. My mom has one daughter, and, and my sister has college courses under her belt. And all of us combined know less than what my mom knows right now because she's enjoying the presence of God. Biblical studies is supposedly my area of expertise, and, and mom knows, mom's running circles around me in what she knows. You've got loved ones, same way. You know where they are. They're with the Lord Jesus. You can't wait not only to see Jesus one day, you can't wait to see them one day, and you will. At the same time, though we have the scripture and we've got great resources, we do not know the sacrifice that Jesus made. To leave that? <laughs> Who would leave that? And if you had an opportunity to, after being in heaven for a while, to, to leave heaven to come back here, would you? Of course you wouldn't, because you already know how this place can be. Wow, did Jesus love us. He left his peaceful home, heaven. You know, the birth of Jesus interrupted the fellowship that he and God the Father had enjoyed unbroken for an eternity. We cannot fathom the sacrifice. The birth of Jesus proved, listen to this, that his love for us was greater than his love for heaven. He loved us that much. And so I ask you, contemplating, what is your spiritual motivation? Avoiding hell? Living eternally? Going to heaven, all of those are wonderful expectations. But let's think hypothetically. Thankfully, this is just a hypothetical. Would you still be a follower of Jesus if eternal life and heaven were not benefits? Would you still be a follower of Jesus because it's the best way to live and he's the best relationship ever to have? What's my point? My point is, do you love God more than you love heaven? because he loved us more. The third and final evidence from our text that Jesus loved us, and that's the overwhelming theme of the Christmas story, is that yes, Jesus sacrificed his perfect life, and, and I'm talking about death. And if you're thinking, well, isn't birth about life? Yes, and when you think about birth, you, you don't extrapolate and go down the road, well, one day this baby will die. No, no, nobody thinks that way. But you cannot help but think about the cross because the cross does cast a shadow on Bethlehem's stable. Y'all, he came to die. He was born to die. Again, verse 8, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Obedient, that's the word that appears in verse 8. Yes. Bitter, that's not a word that appears in verse 8, and I would say to you, not at all. Oh, no. He doesn't do this begrudgingly. As Jesus said in the upper room to his followers, greater love has no one than this, that one lay down his life for his friends. 
Look back again at verse 5. Have this attitude, the New American Standard reads, in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus. The will of the Father and love for us. Jesus had no other passions, therefore no distractions. The will of the Father and love for us. For the Father and for us, therefore, no sacrifice would have been too great. And no service would have been an inconvenience for the will of the Father and for the love of us. That's what moved Jesus and that's what drove Jesus from heaven to Bethlehem to the cross. What about your church commitment? Well, let's just talk about your spiritual commitment. Is, is your spiritual commitment total? As Jesus demonstrates? Without strings? Not tainted by a personal agenda? I conclude with these words. My Father's house of light. My glory circled throne. I left for earthly night, for wanderings sad and lone. I left, I left it all for thee. Hast thou left aught for me? I left, I left it all for thee. Hast thou left aught for me? I gave my life for thee. My precious blood I shed, that thou might ransomed be and quickened from the dead. I gave, I gave my life for thee. What hast thou given for me? I gave, I gave my life for thee. What hast thou given for me? Let's pray. Lord, we're thankful for this wonderful Christmas story and for the time that we're taking this month through a variety of ways to consider how amazing it is. Actually, how amazing you are because without you, there is no story. And for us, there is no hope. There actually is nothing. We thank you for loving us so. We thank you that you sent the very best. We worship you and we thank you for your son who makes all this possible. Hard to believe. Amazing love. And we're the direct object. This is not just a story of history uh, that we learn the facts. This is actually our story. He didn't just come, we realize, for a change of scenery or a change of pace or some sort of recreation or vacation. No. He came for a reason. He came for us. So this Christmas story is as much our story and what a wonderful ending it is if by faith through grace we believe. And that's before us. That's before every person. Thank you for the opportunity to respond rightly to the story that continues. No, it's not ancient history though it happened 2,000 years ago, it continues until he comes again. Help us to spread the word through, through testimony, through our life, through song, through service, as we show the difference that Christ makes in our life. In his name we pray, amen. This is your story.
And this could be the best Christmas you ever have if for the first time you're not just an outside observer, but that you're actually the recipient because you have participated by faith in that which happened 2,000 years ago. This story is about you because you've got a great need. And without Jesus, you have nothing. Nothing. Nothing meaningful, nothing substantial. There's so much more to this life. Would you? Because you're not, you're not incapable of commitment, no. We commit ourselves to lots of things. Lots of things. Direct TV. Cell phone plans. Mortgages. We, we commit ourselves to lots of things. The question is, will you commit yourself to the ultimate person relationship? He loves you. And he wants, he wants a personal relationship with you. Would you give Clint and I the privilege to explain to you the, the facts of the gospel, the good news? So said, this could be the best Christmas you ever have. But whatever your decision, you do as God leads.